message you gave us this morning. God, I pray that we are open and attentive to the scriptures, God. And that uh, we will uh, leave uh, learning something and going away encouraged. God, uh, be with me. Give me an extra dose of your Holy Spirit. God, take away anything that we get in the way of us hearing your message this morning. And we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, guys, I want to welcome you to the Tucson International Christian Church Worship Service this morning. And uh, we are part of a global, worldwide, sold-out movement of disciples. We're about our purpose, to seek and save the lost. I hope you guys were about your purpose this week, seeking and saving the lost. And guys, today is Resurrection Sunday. And some of you might be here for the first time. I hope that you continue to come. That you don't just wait for that one Sunday to come. I pray we come every Sunday because every Sunday we can worship the resurrection of Jesus. This is the most powerful, most widely known event in the history of man. Celebrating Jesus is happening all around the corner of every part of the, the, the globe. And uh, today, we're going to focus and talk about the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. How do we, we're going to talk about how we can come to life spiritually. How we must come to life spiritually. How do we come to life spiritually? I also want to investigate, look at care, uh, carefully Christ. I want to look at the circumstantial evidence. I want to look at eyewitnesses' uh, accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. And lastly, I want to be able to, to hopefully prove from the scriptures that it happened, but also then to show you what you're supposed to do. Because I, I think sometimes we can come to service and go, oh, yeah, a great lesson that I learned about Jesus, and then we can walk away and do nothing. I pray we don't do that today. So uh, the title of my lesson is simply this, Come to Life. Wow. That's the title of the lesson. Come to life. Wow. And the two points I have, I only have two. You guys are like, yes, two points. Not <laughs> <laughs> four. But they are longer points. Okay, okay. First point, repent and come to life. And the second point is Jesus himself came to life. Let's start in first. All right, let's start in Colossians chapter three. Hope you have your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3. It says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you die, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Paul says that we have to set our hearts and our minds on things above. What are those things? Well, Jesus Christ sacrificing his life on the cross. God's love allowing him to do that. Salvation that comes through that. Mercy and grace given to us by God instead of death. We deserve death, but we get something else. Our purpose God gave us a purpose to seek and save the lost. That motivates us because of what Jesus did. And yet, we still focus on earthly things. We can still do that. And I'm going to talk about some stuff this morning. And you might feel a certain way. An old pastor used to tell me this, if the shoe fits, wear it. Some of you guys might be like, I, I don't like that. And we can get defensive if it's a shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't fit, discard it. But it, it seems to, to be that sometimes when we get defensive, there might be some truth to it. Uh, Let's look at uh, Philippians 2. Okay. And while we're turning there, I want to talk to die to self. Die to selfishness. Because, see, Christianity is not all about you. I think sometimes we can get to that mindset. It's all about me. What can I get out of church service this morning? I'm not really feeling it this morning. Wow. 
What do I get out of going to the men's forum? Is there going to be good food at Steve's house? If there's not, I don't know if I want to go. What do I get out of the relationship? Philippians 2, you guys there? Read through 4. Verses 3 and 4. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Are you valuing others above yourself? Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. We got to be doing that. Mary, how's that going? Are you looking to the interests of your spouse? Single brothers, are you looking to the interests of the single sisters? Teens, are you looking to the interests of your younger siblings? Or is it all about you? When was the last time that you actually thought about somebody else and called them to see how they were doing? Instead of getting an attitude because you're sick and nobody gives you a call. Or nobody's reaching out to you to see how you're doing. Or nobody's making a card for you. When's the last time you did that for somebody else? Right. When's the last time you took a care package to somebody else? Instead of waiting for it to come to you. Mm-hmm. When's the last time you picked up somebody for church? Mm-hmm. Right, I got to take the bus. I got to go there. I got to do this. I, when's the last time you helped somebody else? Right. I appreciate it. I want to lift up Ken Yock. You know, he's every Sunday, every Wednesday, he's picking up our brother Angel, making sure he comes to all the meetings of the body. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to, but he's doing that. I want to lift up the sisters in Hong Kong. You're like the sisters in Hong Kong. Wow. All right, we have churches all around the world, guys. And there's some specific sisters in Hong Kong, and they make dinners on Sunday. Wow. Why do they do that? Well, they're hoping that they can have their, their non-Christian friends come to their house and eat for free. And then they ask if they want to study the Bible. When's the last time you had somebody over for dinner? When's the last time you made some dinner for somebody? Isn't that encouraging? I mean, I know, hey, you know what? You want to get to my heart? Right here. And most of the men in here are the same way. Doing something for somebody else. How about impurity? Have you died in impurity? Are there any men in the house? Are there any godly men in the house? Because if we're involved in impurity or pornography or masturbation, we're not very godly, are we? And if we're involved in that stuff, how can God bless our church? We can't struggle with that. We can't struggle with that on a Saturday night or on a Friday night and then go, you know what? I just don't feel like coming to church. Well, duh. You're involved in all that stuff. You're not going to want to come and give and serve and love and be kind and compassionate. We got to hate that. We got to put that to death, right? You know, some of us in here, we have a worldly mindset when it comes to dating. Now, we do double dating in our church so we can protect and guard our hearts. And so the, the, the brothers will take sisters out on dates that are single, right? But if you're not taking sisters on dates, then you're probably not going to want to give and you're probably not going to want to be here on a Sunday. And you're probably going to want to then be a navel gazer and, and, and struggle with all this stuff. On a Friday and a Saturday night. Yeah. But if you're on a double date, you're having a great time. Yeah. You're focused on somebody else. Uh-huh. You're giving to somebody else. Right. I could go on, guys. With single dating, when, before I was married, I was a single for nine years. Uh-huh. Some of you guys even been single for a year. Uh-huh. You're struggling. Oh, I was on a date every week with a different sister every week. It didn't matter if I liked her or not. And I encouraged her. And I thought about it. The week ahead, I'd talk to the brothers like, hey, let's ask these sisters out. Let's go and, 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 and make sack lunches and then take them to the waterfall. I used to do that. It doesn't cost a lot of money. 
to take a sister on a date. I mean, I'd go play Frisbee with them. And they, they, this was the best date ever. <laughs> because they just want to spend time. with. Are you going on dates just to get to know their names? Somebody's been recording me already. That's awesome. <laughs> Someone's paying attention. But I didn't make excuses. It wasn't about money. You don't have to go to the movies every weekend. You don't have to take somebody out to dinner every weekend. It's not about that. It's about the heart. Right. Let's talk about greed. We don't talk about greed that much. Okay. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, 5 through 8. Guys, we're talking. I thought we were talking about Jesus this morning. Right, what's going on? We're talking about ourselves. And you know what? I'll get to that. Colossians 3, 5 through 8. See, because we got to know what we're saved from. Right, we got to know, hey, what do we get involved in? What are we being saved from? Yeah. Yeah. Colossians 3, 5 through 8. You guys there? Yeah. It says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. Wow, we just talked about all that other stuff, but we didn't know that greed was lumped into that, too. Some of us think it's greed is okay. You know, just being greedy for money, that's okay. It's, at least we're not being impure. At least we're not looking at, uh, at this. At least we're not involved in uh, sexual immorality. It's all lumped together. So it's not good. Greed is not good. What, how can greed, what does greed look like? Well, greed is connected with evil desires. Greed comes from wanting something that you don't have. Greed comes from wanting what your neighbor has. It, greed is actually idolatry. It's what it is. Right. Allowing money and things to be a priority over God. So what does that look like? Going to work over meetings of the body. Working on a Sunday instead of worshiping God. You're more concerned about things and money instead of the things that God's concerned about. And we'll get to some of that, but let's talk about selfish ambition. Guys, we're supposed to focus on things above, not on earthly things. And so I'm talking about the earthly things that we can sometimes focus on instead of things above. Can you relate? Yes. James chapter three in the New Testament after Hebrews. We are a Bible church like Isaiah said, so we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures today. And you know what? Some of us are like, ah, I got a hard time with that. Well, you might have a hard time with heaven then. Because that's all you're going to be doing is listening to God all the time. And that's what this is. The Bible is God's word. James 3, 14 through 16. It says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Wow. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Selfish ambition. Some of us think that's okay. Well, not when it hurts other people. It's not. When you're so focused on yourself that it's hurting other people, not okay. And it says that bitterness is the bedfellow of selfish ambition. Did you see that? Yeah. They're lumped together. Yeah. So a lot of you might be thinking, well, I don't think I struggle with selfish ambition. Well, if you're bitter, you do. Yeah. They, they're together. Mm -hmm. Because when you're bitter, then you stop focusing on other people and you start focusing on yourself. Mm -hmm. You become selfishly ambitious and your focus is you. Mm -hmm. you're, you're more ambitious about yourself and what you want to do and building up your kingdom instead of focusing on God and his kingdom. Right. What does that look like? You miss work. I'm sorry, you don't miss work, but you miss meetings of the body. Mm -hmm. You call in sick. No, you don't. You never call in sick to work, mm -hmm. but you do for the meetings of the body. When you do finally make it to church, again, it's all about you. It's your goals. It's your desires. It's all about you. Can you guys relate to that? Yeah, absolutely. If you have bitterness and selfishness, 
in your heart, you are in danger of becoming unspiritual. And it even says demonic. You will find much disorder in your life. If you have a lot of disorder in your life, you got to think about this. Am I bitter? Wow. Am I selfishly ambition? Am I focusing on self? Wow. So how do we focus on things above? How do we become more spiritual? Have a more spiritual mindset? Repentance. Repentance. So we didn't we talk about that last week? Well, we got to talk about it again. Space repetition, right? We need it over and over. We got to talk about it again and again. What does repentance look like? Does repentance look like you go to the sin and then you stop and then you go back to the sin? No, no. no but yet some of us think that that's okay. That's not repentance. That's religiosity. That's not true repentance. Let's look at true repentance. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. We're talking about repentance. Repentance gives us refreshment. Who wants refreshment in your heart this morning? It's repentance then. That's what's going to give you refreshment. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. You get an amen when you get there. Amen. And the Bible reads, See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness. What eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation. Are you guys tired of your sin yet? Are you eager to get rid of it? See what this godly sorrow, having godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow. Woe is me is worldly sorrow. Oh, I'm terrible. I'll never change. That's worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow is I can do it with God. I can do all things through God who gives me strength. We can get through this together. That's godly sorrow. What alarm? Are you alarmed? I think sometimes you've got to get alarmed. Where are we at? What longing? What concern? Are you concerned? I think sometimes that. We think, well, as long as it doesn't affect somebody else, it's affecting you. Yeah. It isn't okay. What readiness to see justice done. At every point, you prove yourself to be innocent in this matter. That's repentance. Stopping. Get rid of it. Be alarmed. Doing it over and over again is not repentance. Turning to God and asking for help is repentance. Getting advice. Some of us guys, we, we try to do this on our own. We don't get any advice. We don't get any help. It's okay. Ask somebody. Hey, if you see somebody in the congregation who's had a victory in that area, ask them, what did you do? How did you overcome? I do that all the time still. I still ask people, hey, hey I've noticed that you, you, uh, you had a victory in this area. What did you do? Everybody in the world does this. People who want to get stronger, they do this. People who want to get excel in, in school do this. That's why we have counselors. That's how we have wise people. We can look at their example and ask for help. Are we doing that scripturally? Are we doing that uh, as Christians? I want to challenge you this morning. Focus on things above. Be obedient to God. That's really God's love. You, you guys... I hear this all the time. I love God. Well, do you obey him? That's how I feel with, with my kids. I feel loved by my kids when they do what I ask them to do. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow, they really, truly do love me. That's God's love. Yep. That's when you know you're loving God, when you're, obe when you're obedient. Love people over yourself. Do something for somebody today. I appreciate my wife. She's like, okay, we're going to have a dinner. Who can you ask to come over? We are. We're having a dinner. Yeah, we're having a dinner. Huh. Invite people over. Do something for somebody today. Look for opportunities to serve. I appreciate uh, Dan and Chinanza last Sunday. They were like, oh, yeah, there's an opportunity to start 
you and the drums over there. I was kind of, I was hoping the drums were going to be here. <laughs> Where'd they go? Right? But look for an opportunity. There's always opportunities to serve and give. Have godly ambition. Have godly dreams. Make God's kingdom first priority in your life. Show it by your actions. Let's truly repent. Why? Because we love God. Because you want to have a freed up heart. Because you want to have what God wants to give you, which is forgiveness of sins. A relationship with him. Because Jesus sacrificed for you. Right. His sacrifice of his life, his, what he did, we get to participate and then raise to a new life. And that should be encouraging to you. Amen? Yeah. So my second point this morning is Jesus himself came to life. Who's ever watched Perry Mason? I know that's an older show. A long time ago, all right, for the older, right, Perry Mason. I have a, a recent cold case files, all right? Okay, cold case. When I was a kid, I'd read this book. It was called uh, Encyclopedia Brown Detective. And I used to read them all because it was so encouraging. But one thing that, that was most important in all these situations is in a court of law, you have to have circumstantial evidence. You have to have eyewitness accounts. To prove anything. What is circumstantial evidence? I looked it up. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a fact or set of facts from which one can infer the fact in question. So if you didn't get that definition, just look it up. It's, it's, it's in the dictionary. For example, that a suspect is seen running away from a murder scene with a weapon in his hand. And this is circumstantial evidence because he probably committed the murder. Right. That's circumstantial evidence. And then we want to look at eyewitness accounts. Who saw it? Was there anyone who saw it? I think sometimes, you know, when we see an accident, we go, okay, who was around to see what happened? They're always interviewed all the time. It's important. It's credible in a court of law. Yeah. And so this morning, we're going to look at this important information to prove that Jesus rose again. Yes. And people have been talking about the empty tomb for, for quite a while, thousands of years. And an old friend of mine, he, he said this, it's funny, he said, you can go to Confucius's tomb, you can go to Buddha's tomb, yep. you can go to Muhammad's tomb, and their bones are there. Now, of course, Muhammad, he's, he, he's, he's buried right next to Jesus. But you can't find Jesus' bones there. They're not there. Interesting. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 27. What happened to the bones? What happened to Jesus' body? Matthew 27. Verse 62. So you guys are going to be like, like sleuths this morning. You're going, to, you're going to look at all the evidence, okay. <laughs> right? Detectives, that's what a sleuth is. Verse 62. It says, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will raise again. So give the order. Matthew 27, verse 62. But give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been risen from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Don't make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. So the chief priests, they convinced Pilate to seal the tomb. Some say they use cement, some say they use wax. And they said, put a guard there. What kind of guard? What kind of guards uh, guard Pilate? Well, they're called Praetorian Roman guards, okay? These were uh, crack troops, hardened soldiers, killed people. 
And I don't know if you know this, but if one of those guards was to let somebody come in and steal something or, or they lost their prisoner, they were to be executed, put to death. And we see that in Acts 16, verse 27. You don't have to turn there, but this is a story about the Philippian jailer. And we know that there was an earthquake and then uh, the jailer, he's like about to kill himself. And Peter says, what are you doing? Don't do that. We're all still here. Why would he be ready to kill himself? Because guards knew that if they lost their prisoners, they were going to be executed. So this would be the same for the Roman guards. So who took the body? If it wasn't there anymore, who took the body? Did the Romans take the body? They had no reason to take it. And in fact, it might cost them their very lives, right? Did the Jews take the body? They didn't want to take the body because this would, in fact, prove that Jesus was right all along. That he actually raised from the dead. So they wouldn't take the body. The only real suspect is the apostles, the disciples. And we understand that the chief priests knew this. They even said it. Let's make sure that this happens so they don't steal the body. So wait a second. The apostles and the disciples stole the body. And yet, didn't they just abandon Jesus a couple weeks ago? Yeah. They just run away from a mob, an angry mob. But now they all of a sudden have the courage to take on Roman Praetorian guards. Hmm. All of a sudden, they got all this courage, all this boldness. But let's say they did. Let's say that they, in fact, took the body. Why weren't they prosecuted? Why weren't they dragged away to jail? Why weren't they taken to court? Why wasn't there a manhunt for them? No, guys, they didn't steal the body. What history states is that Jesus' body disappeared and the Roman guards, they went to the Roman soldiers and they went to their garrison and they went to Pontius Pilate, right? No. They went to the Jewish leaders. Why did they do that? Interesting. Let's go to Matthew 28, verse 11. Why did they go to the Jewish leaders? While the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. Oh. See, they knew that if they went to Pilate, they would get executed. They knew that if they went to the garrison, their generals or their commanders would kill them. But if the apostles did steal the body, then why would they die for a lie. Right. Would you die for a lie? Yeah. So, let's go to Acts chapter 1. The scary thing is that Jesus will actually come back just the way he left. And we're going to get into a little bit more. But I want you to think about this. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. It says, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you in heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And then we also look at Matthew 24 and verse 36, and you can jot this one down. But about the day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. So thinking about Jesus coming back, do you think about Jesus coming back? Because yeah. I'm trying to get you to do some parallel thinking. Okay, did he really raise from the dead? And if he did, the Bible says he's going to come back. I, I, I sometimes get chills, sometimes goosebumps when I look in the, in, at, at cloud formations. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, is this the day? <laughs> Am I ready? 
Do you guys ever think that way? Yeah. Or a sunset? And you're like, whoa. I mean, I've gone up to, to A Mountain. I've gone up to Tumamak Mountain in the morning and at night. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. What if he comes back today? Am I ready? You got to think about this. So we looked at some circumstantial evidence there. Let's look at some eyewitness accounts. Let's go to John 20. Are you guys with me? Yeah. John 20. And we're going to read 1 through 10. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. You know who that is? John. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. There's a little bit of a um, competition there between John and Peter, and he writes about it. I felt that competition last Monday with, uh, um, with Jonathan. So we played basketball, and his brother, um, I was very tired, but there was some competition. The younger John and Peter. It says, he outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He's, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the clothes that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The clothes were still lying in its place, separate from the linen. I don't stop there. I, I love that. Jesus folded his stuff. And he separated his stuff. Are you guys like that? Are, do you have organized life? I mean, Jesus had an organized life. After he rose from the dead, he, did, he had time. What about you? Great example. Since finally the other disciples who had reached the tomb first also went inside, he saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to raise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Here's two eyewitnesses accounts. Peter and John. They go to the tomb. They see that Jesus is no longer there. Is John a credible witness? Yes. Is Peter a credible witness? Yes. And they write about it. Let's look at another credible witness, the Apostle Paul. I think this one is, imp is important. Because he was a persecutor of Christians. His name was Saul at first. And he lived to kill Christians. He lived to put their families in prison. He lived to terrorize Christianity. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Saul. This is important to look at this guy. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have been taking your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. But what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So you thought that it was just Peter and John? No. Wow. There was an eyewitness account? Nope. No, 500 people that were still alive. James, Cephas, and Paul. And Paul writes this, and he says, of first importance. You need to understand what Jesus did, and you need to understand that all these people, 
saw the resurrection, that he came back. If we claim to be Christians, then we need to hold firmly to that same belief. We need to look at the circumstantial evidence. We need to look at the eyewitness accounts and have the same belief. See, Paul was a credible witness. Why? Because he killed Christians. He actually tried to destroy the church. And yet he became a true Christian himself. He was a terrorizer of Christianity. And Jesus appeared to him in Acts 9. He blinded him in Damascus and sent him to State Street where he was baptized. And then he talks about it in Acts 22 again. So I want you to think about Paul for a minute. It would be like Putin in Russia. He'd be saying, listen, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for terrorizing the Ukrainian people for starting this war in the first place. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take responsibility for my war crimes. And we're going to have some humanitarian efforts to take care of the situation. That's what it would be like. That's what happened with Paul. I want to share this with you because that's how baffled people were. Christian people are like, should I really trust this guy? Should I? This guy killed my family. And now he wants me to be a brother? He Now he wants me to trust him? Now he wants me to be in a Bible study with him and baptize my friend. I think he's going to try to kill us. Uh, right. That's the way he could be thinking. Yeah. Eyewitnesses ac accounts. Are they credible in court? You see, Paul died for what he saw and he believed in. All the other apostles did the same. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified and burned upside down next to his wife. Andrew was crucified in 70 AD. James, and the, James, the brother of John, was beheaded. Philip was tortured and crucified in 54 AD. Thomas had his spear driven through him and was burned alive in 70 AD. Nathaniel was skinned and then crucified. Bartholomew was beaten, crucified, and beheaded. Simon the Zealot was crucified. James was thrown from the temple. And after seeing that he was still alive, they beat him to death. They bashed in his head. Thaddeus was beaten with sticks to death in 72 AD. Matthew was stoned while hanging on a cross. John, Jesus' best friend, was boiled in oil and left for dead. He lived, and so they sent him to an island to live out the remainder of his days in pain and suffering. So, did the apostles die for a lie? No. They rose. They believed in what they saw, Jesus raising from the dead. These are the same 12, the ones that all died. These are the same 12 that ran away. We're smart people, right? How, was, how all of a sudden they just have all this courage to die for a lie? No, the most reasonable answer is that they knew exactly what Jesus did. Right. And they lived out the remainder of their days about their purpose, yeah. spreading the gospel. That's the heart we got to have. Acts 1, 3. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. And I'm giving you all these scriptures. I hope you're writing them down so you can go back over and look at the circumstantial evidence. Look at the eyewitnesses account so that you can have your own conviction about Jesus. We're coming into a landing here for a second. Mm -hmm. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And spoke about the kingdom of God. And yet some people have the audacity to say that Jesus never existed. I meet people all the time. Jesus was a, was a folk tale. It didn't happen. Yeah, it did. And you can write these, these down. John 20, 19 through 20. 
Jesus, he meets the disciples. John 20, 24 through 28. Thomas, doubting Thomas. Remember that guy? He had to touch Jesus' palms and his side to believe. The two guys on the side of the road, Luke 24, 13 through 35. They were talking about Jesus, and they're like, oh, man, you missed out. Because Jesus was hanging out with them. They didn't even know it was Jesus. Like, yeah, this was what happened the other day. And then Jesus then shows them, hey, I'm, I'm Jesus. Matthew 28, 1 through 10. The women looking for Jesus. Jesus appeared to them. Acts 2, 31 and 32. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. That he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. It's a fact, guys. So what do we do with this fact? The eyewitness accounts. The circumstantial evidence. Well, we need to believe ourselves, and we need to follow him. Yeah. What do we need to do? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. What do we need to do? You guys know the scripture. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Can you go and make a disciple if you're not a disciple? No. No. Can you be a veterinarian and not go to veterinarian school? No. Can you be a doctor and not go to doctor school? No. I mean, we, we all know this. You have to go to college to, get, to gain the, the information. I can't be a teacher by just showing up at, at, at a school. Yeah. You have to go. I had to go to eight years of, of education. And then I still wasn't a teacher. I had to actually go sink or swim. Yeah. I had to go to my first class. And I was like, can I survive? Can I survive? Can I survive? I survived one day. That was my first day. I survived. I made it. They didn't run me out of the school. You got to be made into a disciple in order to make disciples. And then we just focus on Tucson. Yeah. No. no. That's why we have churches all around the world. And we need to be a part of a movement. A modern day movement that's reaching out to all cities all nations, all continents, everywhere. everywhere, because I, you might have a family member in, in, um, I don't know, Atlanta, Georgia, you might have a family member in, um, Salem, Washington, wherever there's got to be church there. We got to go after all nations. Yeah. And then that's it, right? We, we don't have, we just, we get baptized for, for the Holy spirit. And then we just go back to our old lives. Right. No, that's why Jesus puts in there and teach them to obey. We don't like the obey part, do we? We moved out of our parents' house so we didn't have to obey. I remember that day. Ah, I finally get to do what I want to do. But if we want to follow Jesus, we got to obey. And, and, and you're probably going, well, I already, I already know this. I already know that I'm supposed to go make disciples. I'm, I already know that I'm supposed to get baptized. I already know that I'm supposed to baptize other people. Other people. Well, are you sharing the good news with others? How did your week go this week with sharing with others? I appreciate going to the gym with Steve. Steve pushes me too. I can push him at the weights and he can push me. He goes, hey, go share with that person. Right there. It's like, you do it. He's like, no, you do it, right? But we push each other. Go out two by two. Are you in a Bible study? Were you in a Bible study this week? It's not hard. Just ask somebody if they want to study the Bible. When's the last time that you helped somebody become a Christian? This is making disciples. Jesus said to go, make disciples each and every day. Why? So that people can have hope. Who has hope in here? You have hope? Well, give it to somebody else. If you have hope, give it to somebody else. Give somebody else the opportunity to have forgiveness of sins. Give somebody else the opportunity to understand Jesus and salvation. A relationship with Jesus. Hope. 
Let's look at our last scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. That wasn't that bad, was it? <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. This is Bill's favorite scripture. <laughs> for I know the plans I have for Scott only. No, no for you, declares the Lord. God's got plans for you. Plans to prosper you financially. No, just to prosper you. That could be health. That could be anything. He doesn't want to harm you. That's what it says. This is a promise from God. He wants to give you a hope in the future. And he's talking to, to the Israelites. He say, listen, this is what I want to give you. But you got to seek me with some of your heart. Oh. All of it. 100%. And it applies to us today. He wants to give us the same promise. A security with him. Forgiveness of sins. Relationship with God. Didn't you already say this? Salvation. Going to heaven someday. Didn't you say this? Well, we need to be reminded over and over and over again. Because some of us go away two days later and go, why am I doing this? Why am I doing all this? Why am I sharing my faith? Why am I trying to help somebody else? Because we forget. This morning, I want to challenge you to look at the evidence that's preached, that's presented to you. Go back over the notes. Go back over the scriptures. It's a fact. Jesus raised again. Go over the notes. Be a detective. It's, a, it's admissible in court. So that you can make a decision to be a true follower of Jesus. Resurrection day. We need to repent and come to life. Jesus himself came to life so that we come to a new life. And to God be all the glory. Amen.